working on the film that I'm working on, uh, which is a Ron Howard movie. Um, uh, I've got makeup tests next week, and we start shooting that in a in a, in a few weeks. In fact, the first day of filming is uh, the, the day after the Oscars. Oh wow! Ceremony. So I'm I'm so concentrating on that. I haven't really had a chance to think about the Oscars, to be honest. Well, it's probably a blessing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I probably would be more nervous than I am. It hasn't really sunk in yet. The uh, the implications of it, even even being nominated, really, which is uh, quite an honour. Well, there are th- there are three films uh, nominated in this category, and you're involved with two of them because you did work on the Harry Potter as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I worked on uh, all ten uh, Harry Potter, uh, ten years of Harry Potter movies. So I was on all uh, seven or I think it's eight movies, isn't it, altogether? With the mm. like, been in two parts. Um, so yeah, I worked for Nick Dubman on that, uh, and uh, yeah, that just came to an end last year. Yeah, I, I definitely want to touch on Harry Potter, but but to start with the, the Iron Lady, when this project came around for you, what were the the challenges specific to it that 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 really excited you? Um, it was exciting uh, just to work with Meryl Streep. Um, you know, I've always admired uh, her as an actress. She's uh, amazing. And um, also to um, create such a, a character. Um, I love doing character makeups, actually uh, actually turning one person into another person. You know, I haven't done that many. Uh, so it was really appealing to, you know, to do something different. Um, you know, I've just done a big zombie movie uh after that and before that we were doing all the Harry Potter movies and I did Coriolanus as well the Ray Fiennes uh, mm-hmm. directorial debut so it, it was it was just a really nice change from everything else that I've done yeah and obviously such a you know a, a world a, a character a person known around the world uh, and so it's a very specific look uh, so tell me about the process of kind of transforming Meryl into Margaret Thatcher? Well, it's... Uh, we, first of all, had to just work out how far to take it, you know, how how much to try and make Meryl look like Margaret Thatcher. And really, that was just a case of doing some sculptures and Photoshop designs and uh, really studying uh, what what was it about Thatcher that we could transpose onto... Meryl that would actually work, um, mm-hmm. whether it was hooded eyelids or change the nose, or and we just we just started playing around on the life cast really uh, and doing little sculptures and uh, we didn't have that much time uh, to to get everything ready so it was just it was just really all all hands on deck and uh, um, uh, crank stuff out really um, and then we you know it was just a uh, Conversations with uh, Meryl when she came over for the test, and uh, working out what 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 she was uh, keen to wear and not to wear. She had very specific ideas about the makeup, and mm-hmm. uh, so we worked together really and just uh, honed honed it down. Well, it it would have to be something that, and I'm sure that that's what the conversations entailed. It would have to be something that she's comfortable with, and and that that accommodates you know maximum kind of facial expression on her part. Exactly, yeah. That's what we were striving for. It had to be a you know, a fine balance. You know, we didn't want to cover her totally in prosthetics, and I've said this in, in a few interviews, where, um, you know, it, it becomes restrictive, you know, so we were trying to find the, the minimum amount of stuff we could do while, while still retaining, you know, she still had to look 86 years old. We were, we were just trying to find the balance, really. Um, and, uh, you know, things like the top of the nose filling in her brow, mm. um uh, brow bone there, which Meryl doesn't, you know, she's not got a very strong uh, brow uh, bone like Thatcher had. Thatcher had this hawk-like uh, brow bone at the top of her nose. So we, that was one thing that we decided we needed to do and then fill out her hollow, um, hollow, hollows in her cheeks, you know. Meryl's got really great bone structure, mm-hmm. uh, great cheekbones, and uh, Margaret Thatcher didn't have that. So we, we knew we had to fill out a few things and, and then just age her up from there and then inject whatever we could. We knew also that the, the wigs were going to do a great deal and Meryl's performance, once we first saw, saw her do the Thatcher performance in, in our tests, it was like, wow, she's amazing. <laughs> 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 she's really like Margaret Thatcher, she had it nailed. So, so that, that was very encouraging as well. You know? Can you sense that uh, tr- 
transformation happening in the actor as you're applying your process? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it certainly helped, uh, Meryl, I'm sure, especially with the old age uh, makeup. But even the younger one, just doing the nose piece, uh, just uh, psychologically and putting the teeth in and the wig on, you know, that's it's got to be an enormous help to any performer uh, to, to to have all those uh, uh, contributions, you know. And, and then the old edge makeup, actually, you know, once Meryl went off, once we'd done the old edge makeup and she went off into the, the wardrobe, once she got the costume on and the body padding and the wig and came out of the wardrobe, it was like you really were looking at an old lady. You know, she managed to shrink her size down by about a foot, Um you know, hunching herself over, and uh, and and she, you know, she played it beautifully. She she walked like an old lady, and the manner, mannerisms were all there, not just of an old lady, but an old lady Thatcher. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, it strikes me that we we hear or we think of people like facial plastic surgeons that know kind of every nuance of the face and what occurs in the aging process, but you and what you do, I mean. You would have to have that kind of knowledge as as well. That's right. Yeah, we've uh, studied anatomy, and uh, you know, m- myself and the guys who work for me have most have been to art college, and are generally are, are sculptors, very creative uh, people. Um, so yes, we've all studied anatomy, and we're able to, uh, and you know, just the experience of sticking makeup on for. Uh, 20 years gives you that knowledge of what happens with people's faces and how they move and how soft to make the silicone and where to put the edges to hide them and all that kind of. It's all built over uh, experience and and sometimes looking at makeups and getting it wrong and you know honing your craft. Really, it's all part of it. Mm-hmm. What were the movies that kind of inspired you to to get into makeup? Oh, that's uh, I don't know. My my best friend remembers me saying when I was thirteen that I wanted to m- make monsters for a living mm. uh, and get paid for it, you know. Um, but I don't remember going quite that far back. But uh, he he says I definitely said that when I was thirteen. So I think just watching um, old Universal horror movies, I used to watch Frankenstein and The Wolfman, and my dad used to get me up uh, out of bed when I was about twelve or thirteen to go down and watch them. Um, and then I was always fascinated by, you know, how did they turn this guy into Frankenstein, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think when I was at art college, um, I started, uh, I was doing a lot of drawing, and, and then I progressed on to sculpture, really. And uh, I found a book on Cambridge, I went to art college in Cambridge, and I found a book on Cambridge Market on uh, prosthetics, and it was uh, Lee Bagan's Techniques of Three-Dimensional Makeup. And I just got that book, and it was like, wow, it just sort of opened up a door, really. It was like, wow, I can actually do this myself at home, you know. I can work it through the processes, because there was nowhere really to find out any information when, you know, we didn't have the Internet, and there weren't many books on the subject. But uh, So once I found that book, that was it, really. I was like, I knew there was just something clicked, and I knew this is what I wanted to do as a career. So it must have felt kind of like a full circle moment when you when you did Kenneth Branagh's Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, uh that that was uh I really enjoyed that that project. I was on that for a whole a whole year. But when you work on something like I mean the Iron Lady I'm sure is a different creature altogether, but when you're working on something like a Star Wars does it feel like your imagination is completely freed? Um, each film is different, really, uh, in terms of how much design input you have. Um, quite often, uh, you like on Star Wars, for example, uh, and I was working for Nick Dubman at the time on that, um, we were presented with a whole wall of drawings that had been done over the previous two years, really. Um, and it was like, oh, can you make that one and that one and that one and six of those and ten of those and, and, and so on. But they were already designed, and we were just making them from the designs, you know, and then we life cast actors and transposed the drawings onto uh, the life cast. Um, other times you you ring up and they want your design input, so you can spend a few months designing a, a film before you get involved. Uh, so it, it does vary quite a lot, really, from uh, production to production. Mm-hmm. And which, which I mean, uh, it's a kind of a, a dumb, shallow question, but which of those kinds of experiences do you personally prefer? Uh, 
the the kind of the the, the very kind of subtle Iron Lady experience or or something where you're cr- creating otherworldly creatures in some of these other films. I'd, a variety is the spice of life in yes. my in my book. Um, if I was just I have some friends of mine who work at Madame Tussauds, and they sculpt uh, beautiful uh, re- duplicates of uh, uh, people's faces. And I, I went in there and I did it once for a, a short while, and I really enjoyed doing it. It was a great process, but I didn't. I wouldn't want to spend ten years doing that every mm-hmm. day. It mm-hmm. would become a chore to me. So I love the fact that I did the Iron Lady which was a, a really nice, intimate production. With you know, It wasn't a huge budget. Everyone was working really hard to just create this character uh, and tell this story. And then I went from that and worked on a huge zombie movie called World War Z with Brad Pitt, yeah. and, which was complete mayhem. Uh, and we were doing hundreds of uh, um, uh, zombie makeups. Uh, so... With, I had 52 makeup artists working for me out in, and we travelled to Malta and Budapest and Glasgow, and we shot all over the place, and it was uh, it was it was hectic, but it was it was fantastic. It was really enjoyable. But so I think going from one to the other is great. And now I'm doing uh, you know a, a burn makeup uh, on Nicky Lauder, the Formula One. Uh, uh, world champion and uh, and he had a crash in '76. I'm doing a, a the, the Ron Howard movie Rush, right, um, right. which is about Louder and Hunt, James Hunt, um, which is a, again is a really challenging, interesting project. So it's whatever is uh, exciting, really. You know, you could be a rubbish movie, but you're actually going to a great location, or it could be a really nice bunch of people, or you know, there's a whole whole set of criteria, really. Right. Well, you know, we we uh, I just interviewed Robert Richardson, who's w- one of the DPs on World War Z. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he was talking a little bit about that project, but for you specifically, I mean, this is this is a zombie kind of apocalypse movie, if I understand correctly. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, do you reference at all what has been done with the zombie genre in the past in terms of makeup? Everything was referenced, yeah. Every single zombie movie in history was looked at. I think I'm pretty sure that you know, everybody's aware of um, what, a, what, what everybody else's take on a zombie is. You know, So it's just trying to come up with something a bit more interesting, a bit new. Um, uh, and, then, and then really, you know, if you are duplicating certain... You know, a zombie's got to either move slowly or fast. Or, you know, if you, if you make it move fast, it's like 28 days later. If you make it move slow, it's like... Night of the Living Dead, so you can't you can't be completely new. You just it's a zombie, you know. Um, but uh, you know, having said that, there is a lot of you know you're just trying to find some new interesting uh, mm-hmm. angle on it, which I think we found on this. And I think you know the the movement and everything is, is something that people won't have seen before. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. That sounds like an exciting movie. Uh, but to be involved in the Harry Potter films for as long as you were. I mean, so many people in the filmmaking community uh, there were. Uh, did it did it feel like kind of a, a bittersweet goodbye when that last project came about? Because you're used to another one coming up every every so often. Yeah, there's mixed mixed feelings there. Really, you're sort of sad to see the end of it, but ultimately uh, happy that it's all over with. Really, because. It started to get, you know, after you know each year. The, the, for the first three or four movies, it was like great, you know, we've got another eight months' work or a year's work, you know, so it paid the rent for quite a long time, you know. Um, and then, you know, towards the end, you're sort of like, oh, when is this ever going to end? You know, we never, <laughs> never didn't get into this business to do the same job all the time. And uh, you know, I did uh, Voldemort's makeup, wow. uh, which was great. I loved doing the character, and I love the character. And, Great work to work with Ray Fines, um, but you know when you've done the makeup three times, you know for three different movies, um, it, you know it, it starts to lose its uh, lose its edge really. So, mm-hmm. it, in the one hand, quite quite sad to see it all go because we we met a, a a little community of friends as well working at, at at Leeds, and you know we were like a family, uh, you know, on and off, and it was like family reunion every year, you know, but. Uh, uh, now it's more. I've had a more exciting year since then, um, with all sorts of projects happening. 
and uh, building up my own workshop and uh, and then all this stuff with the awards uh, for Iron Lady is, is, is such a nice uh, such a nice uh, reward for that for that year really so I'm I'm having a lot of fun. You're doing incredible work. Uh, I just wanted to ask one, one more question, then I'll, I'll let you off the hook. Uh, but it always kind of fascinates me when, when, when talents that work on a film when they finally see the finished product. When you, when you watch one of your films, The Iron Lady or anything else, are you able to take your mind off the process of creating that makeup and just? Or are you always looking for flaws? Uh, well, with the Iron Lady, um, I cannot watch it without looking at all the flaws. And uh, every time I look at it, I, I see more things. But other people don't seem to see them. So we can, I know where the edges are. I know what the faults are. And therefore, I, I can see it all. But people will say, oh, yeah, it looks great. <laughs> I'm, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, uh, you know, it is difficult. You can't, I can't detach myself uh, from it. I was really terrified to see it. Uh, I only saw it a couple of months ago, and it was a bit terrifying. Um, but, but on the other hand, you know, I am really proud of what we did on uh, The Iron Lady, and I do think some of it works really, really well, and some of it looks great. And, you know, it, it's, it, and then, you know, it's great then. Sometimes we've done a lot of work on the Harry Potter movies, and it ends up on the cutting room floor, and you mm-hmm. never see it, you know. So at least I knew with the Iron Lady that the work is going to be up there on the screen, and you're going to be looking at her for a, for a whole. Uh, you know, she's in, in prosthetics, in, and she's in practically every single shot of the movie. So, so there, there are prosthetics on screen in, in sort of 90% of the movie, 95% of the movie. So.